Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to Crisis of Crime. My name is Rachel Means and I'm a criminologist. As you know, this is the weekly podcast where we talk about criminology and criminal justice reform. On this podcast, you've heard me talk about the biosocial theory, and today I want to dig down into what those biological factors are, specifically the ones that are going to be causing antisocial personality disorder or antisocial behaviors. Why is it that we're most interested in antisocial behaviors? Well, people with antisocial personality disorder exhibit certain behaviors that make them more prone to committing crime. Now, does this mean that everybody with antisocial personality disorder is going to be a criminal? No, of course not. But it does make them more susceptible to it. Now, the reason that they are more susceptible to crime when they have antisocial personality disorder is because the signs and symptoms are more conducive to criminal activity. So according to the Mayo Clinic, the signs and symptoms, and I'm not going to go through all of them just because there are a lot, but just to kind of hit on the main ones, they have a disregard for right and wrong. They tend to lie a lot or be deceitful towards others. They can be callous, cynical, and disrespectful. They often will use their charm to try to manipulate other people into giving them what they want. They tend to exhibit that impulsive behavior or failing to plan ahead. They can be hostile and irritable at times, and they also exhibit a lack of empathy. In past episodes, you've heard me talk about those behaviors that are associated with antisocial behaviors, things like impulsivity, irritability, sensation seeking, and low arousal. But today I wanted to get into the nitty gritty of how you can actually test for the underlying factors that will actually produce those behaviors. I find this stuff fascinating because you can do tests, you can look at brain scans, you can draw blood and actually see if there are underlying conditions that are making people exhibit those behaviors or that can be an early warning sign that they may develop those behaviors. So I think it's really important, especially with children, if they're starting to exhibit some of those behaviors, you can actually run some tests to see, is there something in their physiology that's making them act this way? And just a disclaimer for this episode, I am gonna be talking a lot about anatomical and physiological things that are associated with the medical field. I am not a medical professional, so I will do my best to try to explain what I understand about how these functions work, but just remember that you have to take everything with a grain of salt because I might not be the best at explaining every single little thing. And I also want to preface this episode that there is no such thing as a crime gene. I know that's been speculation for a while and people sometimes bring it up still, but there has been no gene discovered that separates criminals from non-criminals. So I'm going to be going over a lot of different factors today, including genetics, physiology, including neurophysiology. I'll talk a little bit about neuroimaging as well as endocrinology, and then I'm going to finish off with a little bit about prenatal factors. I always think it's a little risky to talk about genetics when talking about criminality because you don't want to label anybody before they're even born, but it can't be ignored because there is evidence suggesting that genetic does play somewhat of a role. The reason that we know that genetics plays a role is because we looked at studies of twins, both identical twins and fraternal twins, to see how their patterns of criminal behavior were. And they found that identical twins were more likely to be similar in their criminal patterns. Now, just a little background in case you need a refresher on twins. Identical twins have the same genetic material. It was one egg and one sperm. It became an embryo and then split into two different babies. So they have the exact same DNA. Fraternal twins are when there's two eggs and two sperms. They both get fertilized and two embryos develop. So it's essentially just two siblings sharing a womb, but they have completely different sets of DNA. Another area that's been looked at in terms of genetics is with biological and adoptive parents and their children, and if any of them engaged in criminal activity. So essentially what they were looking for was if the biological parents were engaging in criminal activity, if that affected the offspring and increased their chances of committing criminal activity. So they looked at this a couple different ways. If the biological parents were engaged in criminal activity and the adoptive parents were not, or if the biological parents had not been engaged in criminal activity, but the adoptive parents had, and then they looked at the offspring to see if they had been engaged in criminal activity. 
So it's always important to have a control in this situation. So if neither sets of parents, the biological or the adoptive, were involved in any kind of crime, the offspring still had a 13.5% chance of being engaged in criminal activity. Now, if the biological parents were engaged in crime, but the adoptive parents were not, that number only increased to 14.7 for the offspring. So it's a little bit of a difference, notable enough for us to record it and research it more, but it's not to the level of, oh, wow, this is making a huge difference. But what does make a huge difference is if the adoptive parents are involved in crime, because then the likelihood that the offspring will be involved in crime goes up to 20%. So I think that really boils down the argument of nature versus nurture, which one has a bigger impact. Just based off these numbers, I would say that nurture is having a bigger impact. But of course, this isn't the only factor that's going to be influencing whether or not somebody is committing crimes. And then if both the biological parents and the adoptive parents were both involved in crime, then the offspring had the greatest chance of being involved as well at 24.5%. When we look at the physiological factors that increase someone's chances of having those antisocial behaviors, the main physical things that we look at are how low their resting heart rate is. And the reason behind that is if you have a lower heart rate, it's going to take a lot more to get you to that point of being aroused. And that arousal doesn't have to be sexual. People getting excited is a form of arousal. People getting scared is a form of arousal. And so anytime where your body kind of has that jolt of adrenaline and your heartbeat increases, that's what we consider to be arousal. Another test that we can look for is something called low skin conductance. And if somebody has low skin conductance, then it's going to be harder to engage that fight or flight response. And we've all experienced this feeling of fight or flight. It can be you see something really scary. Maybe you get approached by a bear in the woods and you have to decide, am I going to fight this bear or am I going to flee? But you might also experience this fight or flight reaction when you're going in for your really hard math test and you're nervous about it. You feel your palms start to sweat. You start to get cold you get really jittery, you feel like you can't think. And those are all reactions to that fight or flight response that your body is pumping adrenaline into your system because it thinks it's about to fight something. But as I mentioned, with low skin conductance, it's going to be harder to engage that system. And this is really important for criminals because if I go into a store and I'm thinking about shoplifting, my fight or flight response is going to be through the roof because I am nervous about getting caught. But if somebody doesn't have that engage, if they don't have that fight or flight response kicking in where they feel nervous about what they're doing, it's going to be a lot easier to do and to get away with. If we look at neurophysiology, a test that can be performed is looking at the alpha waves in our brain. Now we have a bunch of different types of waves in our brain, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but feel free to Google them. But the alpha waves are ones that we use when we are awake, but we are also relaxed. So we're not super alert and we're not in a deep sleep, but it's kind of like if you were trying to meditate and clear your mind and relax, your alpha waves would be taking over for the most part. Now, they found that people who have antisocial personality disorder tend to have slower alpha brain waves. And so from what I understand about brain waves, as I said, I'm not a medical professional, but it can make it harder for people to have that arousal. Another way that slow brain waves can affect somebody is that we need those brain waves to help us mature. So if somebody has slower brain waves, then it's going to take them a longer time to mature, and therefore their maturity level is going to be lower than their peers around them. And this can lead to them having impaired inhibitory control, which can lead to that under arousal, and then of course to those thrill-seeking behaviors. Now we've talked a lot about fight or flight, and this ties into that as well. And so if it's harder for you to become aroused or excited or find something thrilling, then it's most likely going to make you want to engage in more risky behavior so that you can get that adrenaline rush. And people who are thrill seeking may find their thrills in doing extreme sports like snowboarding or skydiving. But then people also might get their thrills from engaging in criminal activity because someone might find it thrilling to try to break in somewhere and steal something. And it also might be thrilling to have the satisfaction of getting away with it. 
Another test that can be performed is something called a verbal IQ test. And these type of tests determine how well an individual is at problem solving, communicating with others, and their academic performance. And studies have shown that individuals who score lower on these verbal IQ tests tend to exhibit more of those antisocial personality behaviors. The next type of testing that can be done is neuroimaging, and this is brain scans. And the areas that researchers are most interested in when it comes to criminal behavior are the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. The prefrontal cortex is where a lot of our decision-making happens. It's where our personality lives. It's a lot of rational thinking that goes on there. The amygdala is the emotional brain. So this is not a rational part of the brain. And the best way I know how to describe the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex is that they're always kind of battling with each other. One being the rational brain who is making sound rational decisions versus the amygdala, which is the emotional brain that's irrational. And that's why if you're in a situation where you're very emotional, sometimes it's hard to make a rational decision during that time. That's why there are rules in place like surgeons aren't allowed to operate on their own family members because it's likely that they're very emotional at that time and so they may not be able to make the best rational decisions at that time. And lastly, the hippocampus has a lot to do with how we store our memories, but the hippocampus also works alongside the amygdala in regulating our emotions. So that's also an area that we look at for criminal behavior. Now, some of you may have heard that our brains have gray and white matter. And just a very brief overview with my little knowledge that I have on the subject, the gray matter of the brain tends to be around the outside, and it's where a lot of our actual thinking takes place. The white matter, on the other hand, are the neuropathways where information travels from one place in the body to another. So you can think of it as like a neural highway. In studies of brain scans of people with schizophrenia who have committed murder have found that those individuals have less gray matter in their brains compared to nonviolent schizophrenic patients who of course have not committed murder. And gray matter is mostly associated with things like cognition, emotion, and consciousness. So all of those places I mentioned earlier, the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus, those are all associated with gray matter as well. Now let's talk about the endocrine system. So the endocrine system in our body controls all of our hormones. So all of our glands are part of our endocrine system, things like our adrenal glands and pituitary and thyroid and things like that. So one of the main hormones that we study when we look at criminal behavior is a hormone called cortisol. Cortisol increases in the morning. It's what helps you get out of bed and feel awake, and it diminishes throughout the day. So it has its lowest levels before bedtime, and then your body produces another hormone called melatonin, which helps you fall asleep, and then your cortisol raises in the morning again. So this helps you regulate your circadian rhythm. Cortisol is also released when you have that fight or flight response or when you're feeling stressed. It helps you feel very alert and awake, which is of course why it comes in the morning to help us wake up. Studies have found that children who are exhibiting antisocial behaviors have lower levels of cortisol in their body. So not only will these kids not have as great of a fight or flight response or feel nervous in the presence of stress, but it also may affect their circadian rhythm and how they're able to wake up in the morning and go to sleep at night. Studies have also found that adults who are suffering from antisocial personality disorder or exhibiting those psychopathic behaviors also suffer from low cortisol levels. Another hormone that we look at is testosterone. You've probably heard this mostly associated as being the male sex hormone, but it's also present in women just in lower doses. Testosterone is correlated with aggressive behavior, and studies have found that violent offenders do have higher levels of testosterone in their systems. And the last hormone I'll talk about is serotonin. You've probably heard this talked about most when talking about depression and having low levels of serotonin there, but they've also found that low serotonin levels can lead to violent behavior. The last thing I wanna to touch on are those prenatal factors. So there are a few factors that we can look at before a baby is even born to see if they are at risk of developing those antisocial personality behaviors. And the two main things that we look at are if the mother smokes cigarettes or if she consumes alcohol. 
I know this was a very brief overview of some pretty in-depth scientific stuff, but hopefully it gave you a pretty good idea of how different biological factors can affect somebody's potential criminality. Now, of course, I put a disclaimer at the beginning, but I'm going to put one at the end too. Just because somebody has these biological factors or they have antisocial personality disorder does not mean that they are destined to be a criminal. These are just warning signs that we can look at or explanations after the fact that we can see in criminals. And it's a super valuable tool to have, especially when we're looking at kids who are starting to exhibit some of these behaviors because there are therapies that can be done to help curb these physiological or neurophysiological factors that may be affecting somebody's behavior. And the greatest thing is if we can find these actual like physiological tangible factors, then we can actually treat them and not just give somebody medicine to work on the behavior because that behavior is really an expression of an underlying problem that's going on on a physiological level. So I think this stuff is super cool. I hope you do too. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you want to learn more about me, please visit my website. It is www.crisisofcrime.com. There you will find all my other podcasts as well as my YouTube videos, my links to social media, and you will find a support tab if you are interested in becoming a patron to support me. Another great way to support me is just to like and share this podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening today. I really appreciate it. And I will see you guys next time.